Greetings and welcome to In-Depth. I'm DK Ronstar. Now, we recently spoke with the manager of the Student Support Services Division, Dr. Ayinka Nurse Carrington, about re-engaging for success and the role of the SSSD. But it's time now for a look at restorative practices. Dr. Nurse Carrington, thank you so much. We, you are here again, and we're talking about restorative practices as it relates, I guess, to the SSSD. But as always, let's start from a point of definition. When we say restorative practices, what are we talking about? Hi, DK. Thanks for having me once again. So restorative practices, that is a process. And with this process, we are going to use it to manage our conflict in our schools, to resolve our disputes also in our schools, and to build community. So we're talking about shifting our thinking. It's a way of life. We, we tend to harbor on a rule has been broken, but with restorative practices, we're looking at why was the rule broken? So we are moving away from blaming to supporting the students and bringing a level of accountability for all persons in our schools. And I like the fact that you say for all persons in the school, but sometimes you can wonder who is it really for, especially if you're thinking about it. It also, it also feels like a mindset or a change in paradigm. So something that a move from something that is a little more punitive is something that seeks a different sort of uh, methodology. So who is it for? Is it just for students? Is it just for teachers? So I know, okay, I can't, well, we're not supposed to be teaching children in school anyhow, but I can't be as punitive. So who is who are these practices for? That's that's a good question, Nikki. This practice is for everyone. It is a way of life, as stated. So you, you can use restorative practices in, we identify the schools, so teachers, the administrators, the principal, the deans, the heads. We can use it with the peers, so students, the students can use it. They can even take it into the homes. Parents can use it in terms of dialogue. It can be used in the churches. It could be used in government institutions. Everybody can adopt this type of practice and at the moment we are training persons in this practice so our aim is to train at least 500 persons so right now we have had our training for teachers and that was last week and this week we focus on our curriculum officers our heads deans our in school student support staff and in the coming weeks, we will focus on principals, vice principals, and senior student support staff. So it is really coming around to everyone. We even have peer mediation for our students, and we're going to introduce parents to this practice. So we want to touch the entire school community with, with this method of approach, this practice. Okay. But Dr. Nurse Carrington, you say even churches can use it, so you mean we can't send people to hell no more? Yeah, we... <laughs> <laughs> we to send them restoratively. Okay, but and but you but you started to answer something in the sense that um I was wondering how will something like this roll out because uh there's there's one politician who likes to talk about building the plane while you're flying it or building it out while you're flying it, but if you have teachers in classrooms, how do you build this capacity? How do you help to have that mindset reset? at the same time while well, lessons plans are being conducted and implemented. So the fact that you already have already started itemizing the way that things can be rolled out at teachers, curriculum officers, heads, uh, carry me a little further down that path, thank you, in terms of like how it was structured to say, okay, well, this is how we're going to be rolling out this sort of capacity building. Okay, so we, we are looking at what we call a three-tiered level. So yes, we are using our form teachers right now, and we are using form teachers from one to three, and we have selected 11 schools. So we have not expanded it to all the schools in Trinidad and Tobago as yet. So we are just looking at 
the 11 schools that had that presented with the most infractions. Out of those 11 schools, we also, within that group, sorry, we have two control schools. So the infractions are not as high. So we would start at the level of the, the form teacher. And we also have the support of the restorative practitioners that are going to be also situated in the schools to help the process, to move that process. So in a school, when we train these teachers, we, we would have trained deans, head administration, we encourage the whole buy-in. Now, of course, with any new system, you're going to get resistance. And we have had resistance coming out of our training. So you give, you give time for that resistance, you give time for that venting, but I think it's a wonderful opportunity because you get to learn a lot and you get to, people get to share how they feel during that time. But as the training went along, they, they came to understand the process and came to accept that, okay, this is something we can do. So the rollout will start at the level of the form teacher. And of course, we would have the restorative practitioners in the school to support this process. And in terms of giving that time to vent, giving that time for people to express themselves, possibly pushback, uh, is there anything that has come to the fore that has given you pause or said, okay, well, we didn't necessarily look at it that way. Let's see how we can take that and and uh, carry it into the system or use what it is you're saying to carry this the, the process forward a little bit while taking that in mind. Has there been any instance of something like that? Definitely. Can I share an example? Please. Just, you just, uh, well, I'm, 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 I'm glad you offered because I'm not sure of the parameters. Of course, we don't want to get too specific, but yes, thank you. Something like emotional intelligence and how we communicate with persons around us. Sometimes we are so hurried to get things done that we are not mindful of how we speak, how we interact. And one of the areas of the training is removed for the in-school officers and everyone who's taking it at this time will be emotional intelligence and it will help them understand how we work from that level of emotional intelligence. So our students come to school, but our students have real challenges. And these real challenges that they come with, we, we see it in the way that they behave. So with the use of restorative practices and the emotional intelligence component, we would now teach our students to learn to listen more, to interact using I messages. Instead of saying, I get angry at Sam, let's, let's, let's start over. I feel angry when Sam hits me. That sounds simple, but it's a powerful message because students also get upset at teachers and how teachers speak with them and speak to them. So they can use these I messages to say, Miss, I feel embarrassed when you call me slow in the classroom. It makes me feel undervalued. So with getting students to reach that point of, of dialogue and hearing and us listening because we have to take time to listen. So what our students are saying is part of this restorative process. It's not a quick fix. It takes time. So that's just one aspect. And another critical aspect of this process is self-care. So we are so busy doing a lot for everyone else that we don't take time to restore, even just five minutes of breathing, to get yourself together for self-care. And I, I really like the fact that you bring up the, the point that it is no quick fix because that powerful thing because you, you, those I messages that you're talking about, one of the things that I've tried to inculcate within my own circle of people is the importance of that word yet. So I don't know it yet. And the way that opens so many possibilities, but that shift to I feel because is something mm -hmm. that especially... I know Peter Telfer used to say that practice doesn't make perfect all the time, but many times it makes permanent. So something that you have built up over this length of time is not something that changes overnight. But we take a short break. We return looking at restorative practices, who they are for, how they can be implemented. And we also start to ask about some of those timelines. Stay with us. We return after this.
welcome back. Having a fabulous conversation looking at restorative practices, doing so with the manager of the Student Support Services Division, Dr. Ayinka Nurse Carrington. And we got an idea of some of the schools. I like the fact that you said, okay, well, it's 11 two schools, uh, two controls. So you're doing, the, doing it there, seeing what is happening, what may need to be tweaked before it's scaled up a little more. But yes, it's one thing to do it in the schools, but what are some of those outcomes that you're working towards to say, okay, well, these are some of the indicators that we're, we're, we're trying to map as we progress? One of the major outcomes that we would like is to reduce the level of infractions, reduce the level of fights. And this particular practice has been known to reduce bullying and other interpersonal conflict. And Jamaica uses this practice and they have seen a 80% reduction in their suspensions and bullying. We would want to create a caring environment for our students, creating that safe school approach. Something that is very important to this practice is commitment. So, you know, we train, we send people for training, we start something and we stop. We need to be committed to this practice because research has shown that you have to do this consistently for at least two years to see the actual results. Now, you can see baseline results as we, we start the practice and we roll out, we'll see the reduction. But if you really want to see the results, we need to be committed. So, And we also want to engender that feeling of value back into our school systems, value from our teachers. Our teachers must feel valued, our principals our vice principals, our students and our parents must feel valued. Our communities, our schools are based in communities. The community must feel so valued that they want to stand up and support the school. And this is what this practice can do. It's very, very powerful in that nature. And in terms of having people stand up and support the school, one of the things that helps sometimes is that people know, yes, they know their worth, they know their value, but they also know their role within that entire ecosystem within the community that has that school. So are there particular rules that people say, okay, well, this is what you are supposed to do to better help this go forward? Well, I guess each school is going to be unique because they are in their own communities. And what schools can now do is to encourage the community to be part of the restorative process. And it can start by communication. How do we communicate with the shopkeeper outside the school? How do we communicate with the priest or the pastor or the imam that is located in the area of the school? How do we help them to understand the students that we are working with? How do we build those values of respect? Because restorative practice is built on those respect pillars. What do we want our restorative schools to sound like, feel like, and look like? And we can have the community work with the schools to produce these types of things in our schools. It's a whole, school, a whole school approach. Definitely. But it's one thing to say, okay, well, this is what we want to see. These are the outcomes that we're working towards. But one of the reasons that these schools would have been chosen, the 11 schools outside of the two, is that infractions have been committed. Um, <clears throat> what is the process of... Is it a matter of reintegrating offenders? Help, help me, help me with my language. If that, if if, if there's a different term, back into the system. But there's some things uh, like stealing a pencil is different from having a physical altercation. So there's some things that are easier to show grace to an individual. What are some of the things where you need to reach back because things have happened in terms of having that person. Be, still be a part of the school system if, if if it is possible at all well everything is possible as i said it's commitment and it takes practice so the restorative practices would not replace the discipline matrix but it will work in tandem with the matrix so we have built-in pillars in the matrix to allow students to reintegrate if there's an altercation so if you know a student is suspended and the student has to return to school, it's a process. The student is going to, we have to listen to why it is you caused that fight. That fight you fought, but how did that fight 
and this is where restorative practices come in, in terms of the language. How did that fight affect not only you, but the person you have harmed in the fight? How did that fight affect your form class? How did that fight affect your school? How did it affect your parents? And you have the persons who have caused those harms really sit and take in those questions and you hear, you get to the root of the problem. So restorative practice is going to explore the cause of the problem. It's going to also help the students, the teachers, the parents, explore the feelings associated with the problem. And so, so many times we're not listening to the students' feelings. We're not listening to the, the cries of teachers. We're not listening to the cries of the principal. And the type of practice engaged will help us to move towards solving that problem and repairing the harm in the school community. And I'm really happy to hear you say that, Dr. Nurse Carrington, because this actually dovetails very nicely uh, into a conversation that we would have had previously with Professor Corin Bailey, I believe he lectures at the Cavill campus. And he was saying that many times some people think that restorative justice, it's either or. So there's that disciplinary matrix or there's the restorative justice aspect and they think that everything, okay, well, let's just hold hands and sing Kumbaya and everything <laughs> magically will be the way that it's supposed to, as opposed to saying, well, these are a series of steps and it's not a matter of either or, but widening the toolkit so that there are other recourses. Because sometimes when all the only tool that you have is a hammer, everything feels like a nail to deal with in a certain type of manner. But looking at the fact that, that these three parties or general parties, the offender, the aggrieved, and the community, and looking and seeing what actions have, the repercussions the or, of the choices made, and, is, and heading, looking at those things as and in, in a manner to not do it again. It's very different to say, okay, well, I do it so I'll get do the time or I'll get punishment the way that the, the, the disciplinary matrix or that punitive sort of mindset works. But I think it's really important that we're able to make that point that one doesn't just uh, it's, it's exchange for the other. It's not, it doesn't cancel out the other. But this is something that can be used in addition to. And I know that the rollout hasn't necessarily finished as yet because you still have more persons that you're building capacity with. So, They're training again. Mm -hmm. so when when did it start? And are there things that you're already hearing from people with regard to effects, changes that they're seeing, even though this is something that there needs to be a level of consistent uh, consistency with? So the official rollout to schools, we started with training. So we are training at this moment. So we haven't started the practices yet. So we have the persons who identified we're training, which are the principals, the vice principals, the teachers, the deans, the heads, the in-school SSS, the officers, the senior SSS, the officers, and the senior diagnostic specialists. And they are going to be trained. So once that training is completed, we will have our leads because our leads and our facilitators on board. And we really hope to roll this program out in September. Now, one of the things I didn't indicate to you, DK, was that, you know, restorative practices also takes different forms and different types. So you don't use the same practice for the same thing, you know. So you have things like restorative conferences. We use that at a higher level. That's what you call a higher level practice, where when a, a person who has caused harm, because when we talk about students in practices, we don't use the word offenders. We, talk, we say persons who has caused the harm. We may use the word offenders when we talk about restorative justice, because restorative justice deals with the criminal justice system. But the practice deals with the school system. And in this practice, we, as I said, we have the restorative conferences, which we have persons who can stand in support with these students. Who have offend, who have not offended, but who have caused that harm in the school system. We also have something called circle time. Circle time is an opportunity for the form teachers to sit and have time with the students, talk about, and you could choose any topic for circle time. Why did I come to school today? 
how do I feel this morning? Circle time and just get the students speaking to different things. And you would see a wealth of knowledge coming out as we have been witnessing in the training with, with these parties who have been training right now. We also have the peer mediation that allows students' voices to be heard. And it's important to have students' voices heard and have them supported in their course. We are building students with values. We are building students to be assertive. So we need to have them heard. And of course, the effective statements, those I statements, I feel frustrated when something happens. I'm pleased to see that you came to class. I'm pleased to see that you apologize. So these are the types of messages and language that we have to use and continuously use. And that is the type of rollout. So we can start the rollouts, even if your school is not chosen. We can start with some I messages and using that in our schools. It's really hard thing to hear what it is you're saying. I'm wondering if individuals or schools hearing about this can reach out to you to say, okay, well, we want to be part of the next cohort when you're scaling up. Uh, is, is that something that they're able to do? DK, the setting me up. <laughs> well, I'll ask the question. I mean. you're setting me up. But I'm perfectly sure we will do the rollout and include more schools next time. Yes. We have had a lot of good responses from schools who have not been chosen and they are ready to embrace this type of practice. And with that, I want to say thank you very much, Dr. Inka Nurse Carrington. Looking at restorative practices and the way they can impact our educational system and our community at large, because those, those schools, those education systems, education institutions, they are within communities. So thank you very much for the work that you're doing. And I'll, I'll say that to you on behalf of everyone involved. And on behalf of the TTT News team, this has been In-Depth with me, DK Ronstar. Thank you so much for joining us.